morning, Team Rainy. Hi. Well, how are you today? Good. How are you? Good. I was letting the DPH team in for at first. Terrific. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, once the commissioner joins, I'll let everyone in. Oh, she, um, I, she's running late. I'm going to start the meeting. Oh, okay. You're going to take us off. Okay. Yeah, you can let everyone in. All right. Um, Dean Rainey, are you ready for us to get started? Everyone's ready? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, the Commissioner Dutani is unexpectedly running a few minutes late this morning, so I'm going to start the meeting uh, until she's available. I'm Dr. Jody Terranova, uh, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Public Health, and we'll call to order the Commission on Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention meeting for February 14th, 2024. We'll move the item on the agenda of the opening remarks from the commissioner until a little bit later when she's able to join us. The next item on the agenda is to approve our meeting minutes from our prior meeting in December. Everyone should have received those via email. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from our December meeting? This is Patrick McCormick. I'll move the minutes. Thank you, Patrick. And is there a second? I can second. Thank you. That was James Dobbinson. Are there any additions, corrections, or changes to the meeting minutes? Seeing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Or raising aye. Hand. Anyone opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. The next item on the agenda is public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public who are not members of the commission um, to speak or members of the commission to speak at, uh, in their personal position. Uh, if you would like to speak in the public comment section now, please uh, raise your hand. And when you speak, please give your name for the meeting minutes. Just a minute, because sometimes it takes a while to find that raise hand button. Okay. Seeing none, we'll close the public comment portion of the meeting. So next up, we have a special guest with us today. We have uh, Dr. Megan Rainey, who is the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health, who has dedicated her professional career to working on this topic about gun violence. So she's gonna share a little bit today uh, about her work and her plans uh, for the future and how we can collaborate with her moving forward. So at this time, Dr. Rainey, I will turn it over to you. And if you have slides that you need us to share or if you need control to share your slides, please let us know. I would I, I have the ability to share and I would love to share slides. So thank you. Um, it's a real joy and honor to be here with you all today. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a talk. Um, but mostly want to hear from the commission. I know that you all have been doing tremendous work um, for quite a while, and I'm new here in Connecticut. I've only been here seven months. Um, I'm just getting to know all of you, and I'm excited to think about how I can support the commission and how we can work together to help make the state of Connecticut healthier and safer, um, and most of all, how we can continue to have Connecticut be a leader and an exemplar for the nation um, in its work on gun violence prevention. So um, I thought that I'd start with a little bit of a background about myself. Um, I do have a couple of disclosures as an academic. I always talk about kind of where funding comes from and, and where it doesn't. Um, I do continue to sit on the board of directors 
for the Nonviolence Institute in Providence, Rhode Island, which is um, Rhode Island State uh, Violence Prevention, uh, Community Violence Intervention Program. Um, so, so a little bit about myself. Um, I am, in addition to being the Dean of the School of Public Health, um, an emergency physician. And when one talks about emergency medicine and violence, people kind of think, of course, of people coming in with acute gunshot wounds, but this is kind of generally the image that people have is that our job as emergency physicians is to take care of these acute time sensitive conditions, gunshot wounds, strokes, heart attacks, et cetera. But the reality is um, that in the emergency department, we take care of not just the acute injuries, but also their sequelae. And one of the things that I found very early when, when I went into emergency medicine, and actually one of the things that drew me to the field um, was the fact that we are the safety net um, for the United States healthcare system. We are the only place that people can come 24-7, 365, regardless of their insurance status, their immigration status, what language they speak, how much money they have. Um, and we provide a warm bed and a safe place to be and care for all. And we find that many of our emergency department patients, regardless of what they are there for, have a past history of violence, um, whether partner violence, um, trauma in childhood, um, sexual assault, or a past history of physical fights and community violence. And we find that that prior exposure to violence leads to a host of downstream problems, um, substance use, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, depression, and so on. I started my career working on violence as a public health problem from that perspective, thinking about how do I identify folks who come into the emergency department for any reason um, with a history of violence and help both reduce the risk of future violence and reduce the risk of downstream health consequences. When I started my career over 20 years ago, I was not specifically working on gun violence as a public health problem. And as many of you in this commission know, um, the reason why was because no one talked about gun violence as a health problem at that point. Um, I was actually specifically told um, by mentors uh, early on in my career, as I started to notice kind of the stream of young men coming through our doors um, who had been shot, uh, that I couldn't talk about guns um, and that if I did, it would be um, kind of a career killer, uh, reflecting, of course, the Dickey Amendment, which had stopped federal funding for gun violence as a health problem, and which had honestly derailed the careers um, of many of my colleagues in emergency medicine who had been working on the issue. That changed for me um, in the mid 2000s uh, when I took care of a firearm suicide case. Um, some of you may have heard me tell this story before, um, but it was a warm July evening. Any of you who work in healthcare know that warm July evenings are when we expect there to be community violence. And so when we got a call over the EMS radio that uh, they were coming in with a GSW, with a gunshot wound, no one was surprised. And we kind of mobilized the room. There was a buzz of excitement because we had a bunch of new med students and residents, we had nurses, social workers, radiology techs. In addition to the ER docs, we had trauma surgeons um, and you know, prepping for, for what we thought was coming through the door. And, and what ended up coming through the door was not what we had expected, which was a victim of community violence, and instead was um, a young man who had shot himself in the head uh, with his father's firearm. And that case changed my course and my trajectory, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how and why um, in, in three ways. Uh, the first was, that was the first time that I had ever seen a firearm suicide. And as you all know, and as I'll talk about, firearm suicide is, of course, the most common reason why people die from a firearm in the United States. So I started asking kind of why we didn't know that. The second was I started asking why was firearm suicide so fatal? I take care of people who are suicidal or who have made suicide attempts all the time in the emergency department. Now, 20 years in, I've taken care of three firearm suicides. All of them have died. Um, and so it started getting me thinking about kind of the mechanism and the gun itself. And then, it, which kind of led me to really commit to working on gun violence rather than just violence in general as a public health problem. And then the third thing about the case that stuck with me um, is that that young man who killed himself was white. And the reaction of the room to him versus to the young men that we took care of almost every night in my emergency department, who were generally black or brown young men, was dramatically different. And that was at a point before we talked about structural or systemic racism in healthcare, 
but the difference was palpable. And it reminded me that I had a moral duty to call out this problem, right? And to not let it kind of slide under the rug just because it was young black and brown boys and men who were getting shot. That of course was followed by the tragedy here in Connecticut um, in Sand at Sandy Hook, um, which raised the profile of gun violence as a public health problem um, nationally. And then the 10 years since um, have, have spent um, trying to continue to change the public discourse, but also to create evidence about what works. And along the way, um, and I want to acknowledge this is probably true for many of you on this call, um, have lost friends um, to, to gun violence as a public health problem. Um, this is Tamara O'Neill, a fellow emergency physician who was shot and killed uh, as she left an ER shift um, in 2018 at Mercy Hospital. Um, her ex-fiance knew her schedule and met her in the parking lot um, when she walked out of her shift. Uh, her ex-fiancé also then killed a pharmacist and a police officer. And I put this up to remind us that um, as we talk about this topic, it is quite personal for many, if not all of us. Um, and so I do recognize that and, and kind of acknowledge that the trauma is shared um, amongst some more than others. Um, but uh, to not forget that as we talk about this problem, it's our own friends, parents, sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews, um, and community members who are getting shot every day. So what is the public health approach to gun violence? Yeah, you all know this, so I'm going to go through it quickly, um, but I think it's worth kind of talking about kind of the four-step approach um, as a good academic um, to, and, and why I think it matters so much. There's this misconception as we come out of COVID that public health is entirely about laws and, you know, nanny state. And, and of course, as anyone on here from the Department of Public Health knows, that's not the truth, um, but it's worth talking about what public health is. So the first step in the public health approach is to gather data um, to measure how common a problem is, um, who it happens, you know, where it's happening, um, characteristics of what makes it fatal versus not fatal. Um, and then the second step is to use that data to identify risk and protective factors. So all other things being equal, who's more likely to be affected by a disease or an injury, who's more protected, all other things being equal. The third step is using those for that, that data and that risk and protective factor information to develop and then evaluate interventions. So we say, you know, here's something that we know increases risk. How can we remove that risk factor? And does that actually change the outcome we care about? Or uh, how do we increase protective factors? Maybe we can't change the risk factor, but we can improve resilience or protection. And then of course we have to see, does it work? And finally, in the fourth step, once we know what works, we implement it. You all know this, but it, this is an approach that has worked over and over across history for car crashes, for HIV, um, unfortunately, it's not working for firearms because we have not applied it, right? We have minimal data um, other than on deaths. Um, we don't know a ton about risk and protective factors other than obviously having a firearm increases your risk. Um, and we know some kind of very basic data around um, gender and race. Um, and for interventions, and I know that this commission is uh, focused primarily on community violence, um, but for interventions, we know only the very basics at this point. So, you know, for community, and I'll talk a little bit about this, but like for community violence interventions, we know that some work better than others, but we're not sure why. We don't know what the characteristics are of the one that works, and we don't really know how best to disseminate. Because we have not applied this public health approach in a systematic way, we of course are seeing firearm suicide and homicide deaths skyrocket. Um, firearm suicide deaths have been increasing in the U.S. inexorably since about 2006, right about the time I started working on this issue. Um, and homicide deaths have bumped up and down, um, but really have been increasing pretty significantly since 2014. We saw a huge bump during COVID that has been mitigated a little, according to the preliminary data, but not completely. Um, we're still far higher than we were uh, pre-COVID and certainly pre-2014. Unintentional or quote unquote accidental um, firearm deaths are a very small percentage of overall firearm deaths uh, nationally. Um, and those have stayed pretty steady, although as I talk about, we're seeing increases in one group. And this is the group that we're seeing increases in. This is um, patterns of firearm death among kids in the United States. And we see that homicide, firearm homicide deaths have increased substantially, firearm suicide has increased substantially, and we are seeing an uptick in unintentional or accidental firearm deaths among kids. 
legal intervention, you'll see this gr the gray is the confidence interval. We really don't have a great idea of what's going on um, with deaths from legal intervention, unfortunately, and I'm happy to talk about that. It's really kind of talking about law enforcement officer involved shootings of kids. Um, and, and I'm happy to talk about that in the question and answer if you want. Connecticut, of course, is in an unbelievably enviable position nationally in terms of death rates. Um, we're amongst the lowest firearm mortality rates um, of any state. Um, we hold that enviable position along with Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Hawaii, um, and a few other states which quite honestly have stricter laws around firearms. Um, but our firearm death rates are still higher than would be accepted in just about any other developed country. And um, this is from Data Haven, which is what already here in Connecticut, one of my favorite sources of data. Um, already, our, our, our distribution of firearm deaths actually mirrors that nationally. So that although our overall rate is lower, um, again, most of our deaths are suicide, homicide next, and other and unintentional um, in particular is about 3% of deaths. Two notes around the homicide deaths. Um, one is that that includes intimate partner violence deaths, right? And so for women, um, intimate partner firearm homicide is the most common form of homicide. That also includes public mass shootings, um, which nationally are only around, depending on how you count them, somewhere around two or three percent of firearm deaths nationwide, but of course are the things that both appropriately capture the public uh, attention and should be never events. A little more data around um, Connecticut. Um, again, you all know this, but although Connecticut's overall gun violence death rate is quite low, um, we have cities, including Hartford and the city that I'm now living in, New Haven, um, that have firearm death rates that uh, are, are quite close to that of the U.S. Um, overall, uh, highlighting the fact that there are tremendous disparities, and I know that's why this commission was created. Um, this is kind of the suicide versus homicide death rates. Again, Traditionally, suicide far outstrips homicide deaths um, in, in the state. Um, and just a, a nod to the fact that there are huge disparities, um, not just in where firearm homicide and firearm death rates happen, but also in race and ethnicity um, with Black and African-American um, folks in Connecticut uh, being disproportionately likely to be killed by them from, from homicide. Um, white Connecticut residents are more likely to die from firearm suicide. All right, enough about data. Now let's talk about interventions, um, but I like to start with it because from that data, risk and protective factors, um, uh, interventions, and then dissemination, I think it's important to make sure that everyone starts on the same page on where data is. So when I talk about the public health approach, um, one of the things that, that folks say is we'll kind of, right, we, we try to start with a theory. And this is the social ecological model that many of you are familiar with. It's the idea that there is no um, injury or illness that happens that is not affected by the full spectrum of the culture and society in which we live. And so when we look at risk and protective factors, and when we look at potential interventions, we think about them on the individual level, but also on the relationship or family level, the community level, and then the societal level. And there are different types of interventions along each. And I'm going to take you through some of the data and some of the type of studies that are being done with the hope of spurring some discussion about ways that we can work together. How can I bring our school's focus on data and research into the work that you are doing? How can we use maybe some inspiration from work that's being done outside of Connecticut to help inform the work of this commission? Um, and again, with that larger goal of, of trying to make Connecticut or maintain Connecticut status as, as really a leader in this space. So, you know, I mentioned that very early on in my career, I focused on violence in general, um, and I continue to do a lot of work um, around uh, community violence in general, trying to stop the cycle long before someone gets to the point of being at the wrong end of a firearm. Um, and this is one example of a type of study that we're doing. Um, we will be launching this uh, actually in the Yale New Haven Health um, Pediatric Emergency Department starting within the next month or two um, in collaboration with Dr. Doddington, um, so quite thrilled to be doing this, where we enroll youth age 13 to 17 who come to the emergency department for any reason um, who've been in a physical fight for the last year. That's about 40% of kids um, who come through the ED. And we enroll them in a brief in-person intervention and then a two-way text messaging program for about eight weeks. 
And our data suggests that um, kids who enroll in this program have lower rates of physical fights after being in this program and lower rates of depressive symptoms. They learn how to manage their emotions. Um, they learn how to manage conflict um, more uh, with, with kind of greater um, resilience um, and flexibility. Um, so a, an example of an individual level intervention that can have tremendous downstream effects um, on deterring uh, and, and kind of redirecting um, for many of the factors that lead to gun violence. There are also interventions that we're doing um, that are purely online. Uh, we did a study called IMPACT, um, which I'd be happy to chat more about, uh, which was for kids who've been victims of cyberbullying. Um, this was done entirely through Instagram, um, used a similar method to the last study that I talked, the last program that I talked about, where it's a two-way interactive app. Um, interestingly, by doing this study purely on social media and by focusing on, on um, cyberbullying, we recruited a disproportionate number of youth uh, who self-identified as LGBTQ+. And this study conducted over the course of COVID showed significant decreases in stress, in depressive symptoms, improvements in self-reported social support, um, and, and improvements in the ability to respond to cyberbullying incidents, despite the fact that it was occurring kind of in the midst of, of this national trauma of COVID. Um, another way that we can help to divert kids long before they get to that kind of downstream effect, um, a downstream consequence of gun violence. There are also individual interventions that many of us are working on um, for healthcare providers. Um, this is a screenshot from a program led by a colleague at UC Davis um, called Bullet Points, which is all about training healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, social workers, psychologists, on how and when to talk to patients about firearm safety. There are a number of ongoing studies looking at the best way to have these conversations. Um, there's uh, at, at with whom, by whom, um, and how best to counsel. And I'm excited that, um, again, Yale New Haven Health is uh, doing some work in this area um, with uh, soon to launch a program um, to provide safe fi firearm storage options to uh, visitors and patients who come in carrying a weapon, which happens more often than you would like. Another example on if we start moving kind of from that individual level more out to the community level are nonviolence um, programs of which there are really kind of three big groups, as you all know. Um, the picture on the upper left is of a program that um, another emergency physician who I work with, Kristen Mueller, works on, honored to get to be part of her work um, in St. Louis, which has uh, the highest pediatric firearm fatality rates in the country. Um, the Love Outside of Violence program is a hospital-based violence intervention program that provides really wraparound care um, to, to youth and adults um, who've uh, been uh, hospitalized after assault. Um, and that's one model. Um, there are also, as you all know, um, violence hotspot programs like Cure Violence, for example, where we kind of focus on the folks that are most likely to perpetrate or be victims of violence, um, usually using data. Um, in collaboration with um, law enforcement. And then the third type of nonviolence programs that are frequently implemented and studied are community mentoring and intervention programs. This is like the nonviolence institute that I sit on the board of in Rhode Island, where they're not, they come to the hospital, but they're really community-based. And, and their whole mode is kind of doing that upstream prevention, being a trusted adult um, in a kid's life. Interestingly, some of the best data for violence prevention is around mentoring. Programs like 4-H and Big Brothers Big Sisters um, are some of the most effective violence prevention programs in general. Um, and there's good data behind each of these. Um, and, and you all know this, but I think it's important to point out because we want to be spending both taxpayer dollars and time and energy on things that work. We want to do things that make us feel good we wanna provide services to our communities that are suffering, but we wanna make sure that the things that we are doing are not just making us feel good, but are also actually changing outcomes. And this is where the evaluation is quite important. Um, there are some examples of programs in each of these three categories of violence intervention that do work. But I will be honest, there are also examples in all three categories of programs that have not made a difference. So one of the things that many of my colleagues across the country are working on is seeing what is the difference between the ones that work and the ones that don't. We'll find sometimes that programs like Cure Violence, which has some great statistics in some cities, work well in some places, but don't work in other cities. So what's the difference? Is it the design of the municipality? Is it the way that they're working with law enforcement? 
Is it something else about the city and its structure that prevents their model from being successful? These are really important questions for us to answer so that we can help support the folks that are on the ground trying to do this work. We'll see, again, personally, from my experience as a board member, I know that, and, and from my experience as an ER doctor, um, I know the trauma that these, um, that the workers in violence intervention programs go through when they lose someone that they've been part of mentoring. And I know many of you on this commission know that personally as well. Um, and so I'm just kind of to, to put a, a, that point on, on the importance of this study. And I'm grateful to the Department of Public Health and to Connecticut for funding evaluation of uh, many of the violence intervention programs in this state. I wanna talk a little bit about Ready Chicago, um, which I think is a tremendous exemplar. Um, Chicago is a tremendously complicated city, uh, both from a gun violence perspective, um, but also from a community perspective. The various communities within Chicago, each have their own trauma center, each of their own kind of culture and community base, and each honestly have their own violence intervention program. Um, Ready has been a collaboration between University of Chicago and Northwestern and a group of violence intervention programs across the city where they gather data from the city, from multiple neighborhoods at high risk of gun violence. They have partnerships with Chicago PD um, across the city. They've created partnerships with multiple hospitals, which uh, as any of us in healthcare can attest, is perhaps the hardest thing of all to get hospitals to share data with each other and have used this to create hotspotting and direction of the violence intervention programs on a local level in a way that's tremendously flexible, and then have studied it. And there have been a couple of really great papers that have come out recently um, from the larger READY team. Um, this, the papers have come primarily um, from Northwestern rather than from University of Chicago, showing that um, some of these community violence intervention programs are actually quite successful on the neighborhood level. And so I highlight them not to say that, you know, we need to mimic exactly what they're doing, but just as a really nice example of how these partnerships can accelerate investment into and success of the programs on behalf of the communities that we all care about. Okay, community violence, talk a little bit about mass shootings. Um, and, and I say this, you know, talk with um, respect and gratitude for those in this state who have been personally affected um, by you know, one of um, the worst and also most publicized um, public mass shootings um, in our nation's history. So you all are deeply aware of the dialogue um, around uh, mass shootings and mental illness. Um, and I'm gonna say kind of, as I move into this in the next section, acknowledge that this commission is largely about community violence, but I think we would be remiss to not talk about the other types of gun violence as well, because they are so deeply integrated. Um, so. Uh, mass shootings. Um, there are lots of folks that talk about, oh, this is a problem of mental illness. And of course, in popular parlance, no one would commit a mass shooting if they were not quote unquote crazy. But popular parlance is not the same thing as a diagnosable disorder of mental illness. And blaming mass shootings on mental illness further stigmatizes the mentally ill who are already struggling to find adequate treatment to be cared for by their community. And when we actually look at kind of warning signals for mass shootings, um, we find that mental illness is not actually the biggest risk factor. Yes, about two thirds of mass shooters had some history of mental health concerns according to a um, project that's been done by the Violence Project, which is slightly higher than the average. But the much more significant thing is that A, folks were generally in a noticeable crisis prior to their shooting, right? If we look at that shooting that just happened in Texas um, at Joel Austin's megachurch um, a couple of days ago, everyone said, we knew this was gonna happen. You look at Lewiston, Maine, everyone knew this was gonna happen. There are signs, there is leakage that people that we can act on. Um, and then the other thing is, is that folks that commit public mass shootings often have a prior criminal history and a prior history of violence particularly domestic violence, which is where domestic violence restraining orders, um, removal of firearms from people who have a history of domestic violence and enforcement of those rules become incredibly important. So can we pinpoint who is going to commit a mass shooting? No, but are there risk factors that we can look for and act on? Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's important for us to commit further to doing this work. Uh, because of that history of violence, this is again where this intersects with community violence and domestic violence, right? When we talk about gun violence, homicide, there's a deep overlap um, with risk factors for mass shooting. There's some really interesting work being done on a national level 
um, around also uh, identifying one of the things that we're increasingly finding as a risk factor for these public mass shootings, which is not just a history of violence, um, but also a history of being part of a hate group. Um, there is a deep overlap, um, particularly increasingly around um, the link between um, anti-Semitism um, and uh, public mass shootings, um, but there's other kind of white supremacy and, and um, uh, other hate groups as well. Um, so there's some quite interesting public health work being done to, to try to um, pre-bunk or reduce that risk. Two more topics that I'm going to talk through as we think about kind of interventions that are promising that we could consider here in Connecticut. Um, I mentioned early on in the data section the dramatic rise in um, gun homicides um, over the last two years, but also the rise in gun homicides over the last approximate decade. And there's a lot of um, hypotheses out there. Um, this graph comes from the Surgeon General's report, but there's a lot of um, uh, hypothesis that that uh, intersects with increases in loneliness, social isolation, and decreases in social engagement that we've seen over the last decade in the United States. Um, and this is one of the things that has led to, to some of the work that I think is quite interesting and promising as we think about reducing gun violence um, on a local as well as on a national level, which is how do we on a community level try to increase that kind of mentoring and connection as a way to reduce the risk of community violence, but also to reduce the risk of suicide and mass shootings because people look out for each other. So I'm doing a study in collaboration with 4-H um, nationally called Guardians for Health, um, where we're trying to train kids to basically in the Sandy Hook Promise terms, let's see something, say something. Um, not in a school setting, but as part of a community. How do you know what risk factors are for gun violence and, and how do you know what to do? And we're finding quite promising data. Um, Sandy Hook Promise has also studied this type of bystander intervention, empowering people in the community to care for each other and to do something. Um, and to pe a paper out just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, reported that by sharing these firearm related tips in a statewide school anonymous reporting system, um, that they saved uh, 611 lives, mostly from suicide, um, helped 4,700 students. Um, and interestingly, uh, over 10% uh, of these um, alerts were around firearm related risk. A lot of folks talk about, well, on a societal level, we just need to increase mental health care. Um, we find that a 10% increase in the behavioral health workforce only results in about a 1% decrease in firearm suicide rates. Equally effective and far faster to do, um, not requiring us to train up a whole bunch of new people, is to remove firearms um, from the homes of those who are highest risk. Um, this study comes from Connecticut. Um, kudos to the state for being the first in the country to pass a red flag law. So as we start moving into those societal interventions, it's thinking about how do we put policies and norms in place on a community or statewide level um, that, again, makes people aware of risk and helps to remove those firearms from, from folks that are at highest risk. Um, again, starting in Connecticut, we now have red flag laws enacted in 21 states plus DC, um, and unfortunately not in place in many others. Um, and we find that in some states, um, including here in Connecticut, that those red flag laws are being used more frequently. Um, but this is a space where I think we have a lot of work to do. Uh, we know that when red flag laws are used, they reduce firearm suicide. Um, they do, they, there's some preliminary evidence that they may reduce domestic violence deaths. Um, and, and there's some case studies um, that suggest that they may reduce the risk of, of mass shootings. But uh, there's also lots of data showing that police, healthcare providers, um, and families don't know about it and don't know what to do. Uh, so this is a, a space that I think um, we collectively could do more work um, on a statewide basis to serve as an exemplar for other states that are trying to figure out how to implement and use their red flag laws. And then there's policy in general. Most of this talk has been about changing community and community norms, about changing awareness of risk, um, and about uh, reducing access of a firearm that's already uh, accessed by someone at risk to a firearm that's already in their hands. But there's a lot of laws that help us to keep firearms out of the hands who are, of people who are at risk from the get-go. Um, background checks, again, prohibitions associated with domestic violence, um, child access prevention laws, which again, Connecticut has been a leader in with Ethan's Law, um, minimum age requirements, licensing and permitting requirements, and bans on the sale of assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. Um, 
all have evidence suggesting that they're quite effective. Um, concealed carry laws and stand your ground probably increase the risk of violence um, and, and firearm suicide. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done here as well. And, you know, laws matter deeply. And as I look at this commission, we all know that laws matter when they're enforced and when we have community norms that support them. So one of the really interesting thing about the child access prevention laws, for example, is that although we see a very strong correlation between states with child access prevention laws and states with lower rates of child uh, firearm suicide, homicide, and unintentional injury, there's a lot of debate about whether which comes first, the law or the community norms, because we know that those child access prevention laws are very, very rarely enforced, and in fact, are very rarely talked about at the time of sale of a firearm, despite kind of mandates that, that you know, depending on the state. Um, so to me, yes, we need to pass laws, but we also have to make sure that people know about them and practice them. Um, some of the recent uh, high profile cases, such as the conviction of Ethan Crombley's mom in Michigan, may improve parents' awareness of the importance of keeping your firearms stored safely. But we know that most kids that shoot themselves or someone else do so with a parent's firearm. Um, so, so programs like that are tremendously important. Lastly, things like child access prevention laws matter deeply, of course, for our community violence, um, because we know that most firearms that are used in community violence um, are uh, either you know trafficked or a friend or family members. Um, so so those types of laws can help reduce uh, access to firearms for those with intent to harm someone else. Uh, lastly, as we talk about interventions on a community level, um, I would be remiss to not talk about structural change. You know the reality is we have 400 million firearms in private hands across the United States. Those are not going away. Gun buyback programs have been shown to do virtually nothing other than to make us feel better. And even if we stop selling all firearms today, which is not going to happen, it violates the Second Amendment, um, that's not actually what I'm proposing. We still have a lot of firearms out there. And so there's a lot of potential for people to hurt people. And so we have to think bigger than just, okay, yes, we need to identify individual level risk. We have to change family and community structures. We need to think about laws and their enforcement. But we also need to think about how do we change the structure of society to help um, make a difference. One of the things that I and others are increasingly looking at is the cycle of fear and violence. Studies show that 54% of American adults, either themselves or someone in their immediate family, has been part of a shooting or adjacent to a shooting, firearm suicide, homicide, or mass shooting. 84% of us say that we have changed something about our lives out of fear of violence. And that rate goes up if we look at Black and Brown communities, right? The chance of knowing someone personally or the chance of um, having changed something about your life due to fear increases when we look at those communities that are most affected by gun violence. We also know that the communities that are most affected by gun violence, kids who have had a shooting in their neighborhood, whether or not they knew the person that was shot, have higher rates of mental health problems in a couple of weeks after a shooting, higher rates of ER visits for mental health problems, lower scores on school tests, right? So the, the stress and the trauma has a multiplicative effect. There are some things that are showing promise on a community level to deal with this while also recognizing that we do have this epidemic of easy access to firearms out there. So it's a both and a harm reduction approach. Examples of these type of interventions include putting um, gardens into vacant lots, uh, rehabbing uh, abandoned buildings, these programs in rigorous randomized controlled trials have been shown to decrease depression and stress in the communities where the gardens are put in or where the abandoned buildings are rehabbed. They've also been shown to decrease violence and gun violence. And there's something that can be done without passing any laws with some taxpayer investment, but not a ton. Um, and and in, in ways that kind of mobilize the community and make the community healthier, kind of in, in a ripple effect of positive um, uh, kind of after effects rather than in a punitive way. And here I'll close by mentioning um, Nelba Marquez Green, who has joined me quite kindly um, at the Yale School of Public Health um, to help grow this type of program of work where we think about not just how do we prevent the incident from happening in the first place, but also how do we mitigate the grief, trauma, and loss that happens afterwards, knowing that only by addressing the trauma and the ripple effect of violence 
And only by listening to the communities that are affected are we going to hope to actually make progress on this uniquely American epidemic. So with that, I will close so that we have some time for questions. If you take nothing else away from my talk, um, the first is to know the facts, to, to gather the data. Um, and so I would urge us, as we are thinking about this commission, to think about ways to augment the data. Again, I know personally that a community violence intervention worker, the last thing on their kind of list of things that they are worried about is trying to gather data. But without that data, we can't develop and evaluate the interventions. So that would be the first one is to kind of know and share the facts. The second is to share our stories because they humanize the facts. But the third is to join us in taking action and doing what works. To know that I personally, um, Nelba, who's on this call, um, the Yale School of Public Health, I know our colleagues at UConn, and I don't know, I can't see if they're on the call or not, but those of us in academia are deeply committed. Um, most of us try to come to this from the right perspective, which is our job is to elevate the community voice and the community's ability to do things that work um, and to, to not hesitate to partner with us um, as we all kind of try to find our way through this impossible moment and situation that we're in um, where our communities are deeply traumatized, but also where there is hope and promise. Um, so thank you. Thanks for having me and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you so very much, uh, Dean Rainey. And I apologize uh, to everybody on the commission for being a few minutes late, but I came in just as you were starting. So um, I'm glad I got to hear your entire presentation. Thank you for this very um, informative and insightful and inspiring talk. Um, so I wanna take um, questions from the audience. I also just, before I take the first question, um, I did see a comment in the chat about how 29% of suicides are attributed to firearms in Connecticut. You know, one thing I would just say is it's important to think what your denominator is. So I think Dean Rainey, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were saying of firearm deaths, 51% are suicide in correct. Connecticut. It's a so different thing to say of suicides, again, the denominator being suicides, 29% are related to firearms. So I just wanted to clarify that, you know, in terms of what our data at DPH shows versus, you know, the data that you uh, share. Does that sound consistent with what you that does. understand? So, so yeah, in Connecticut from 2018 to 21, 21 uh, 56% of gun deaths were suicide deaths. I actually don't have the Connecticut data on the percent of your suicides that are from a gun. My suspicion would be that it has gone up since 2015. Um, I do, I will say that Connecticut is historic. I, I don't, again, I just, I don't know the, the most recent data off the top of my head. Um, but I do know that Connecticut was historically an outlier in terms of having a lower percentage of deaths that were from firearms, but that almost all states have seen an increase in the percentage of suicide deaths that are due to firearms over the last decade. So, so even if that data that, that was, so Manisha is, Dr. Jutani is absolutely correct. And, uh, my suspicion is, is that 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 stat has changed over the last decade. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, turn over to questions now. Pina, go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thanks, Megan. Hi, Pina, it's good to see you. You too. Um, um, awesome talk, and thank you for uh, uh, for sharing all the the data. I just have a question around the gun buyback uh, programs, mm -hmm. and I know we've we've talked uh, before about it. Is um, what could we be measuring different that would turn that, those uh, uh, ideas around those programs um, to not be so negative towards them? And I, I, I'm a big fan of them. I also think that um, we're learning a lot of data from them that I'd love to, to sit down and share with you regarding um, where they're coming from. Uh, it's a safe venue for people to turn in firearms that no longer um, can store them or, or like a veteran who has died and, and a widow who doesn't know what to do with it and and feels safe coming there. And so that's one piece of it. And then another piece that I found with all of the surveys that I've been doing, it's really the background checks we've been focused so much on, but the other end of it is exactly. when some when someone dies, we th these firearms are left there and nobody knows where uh, they, you know, I died tomorrow, I have X amount of firearms in my house, my kids inherit them, they don't have a permit, they don't know how to use it. So, um, and then, 
So that's the second yeah. piece of it. And then the third piece, we're actually taking those firearms uh, after they're vetted with police and then turning them into garden tools and bringing them back out to the community and having those conversations of how they can transform themselves in the community. So just want to see what your thoughts are around that whole, our whole program around swords to plowshares and, and now a national effort on guns to gardens, which we have just in just about every state right now. It's terrific. So, so I know I'm, I threw a lot at you, so sorry. But. Yeah, no, no, no. So absolutely. So so the reason why I say that gun buybacks, the data suggests that they don't work. Um, it's a couple of different things. First is, is that the uh, firearms that are collected in gun buybacks are generally not ones that are being used in um, crime uh, or in suicide. And we actually don't see a decrease in firearms, sh in shootings, in deaths, in communities after gun buyback programs. The second part is, is that it's a lot of money and time to put together a gun buyback. Um, you mentioned turning the guns into plowshares. There's a lot of controversy about how those firearms are melted down and how the parts are used. Um, and so kind of is the, is the money being used in the most effective and efficient way in a gun buyback versus say using that time and effort to create a mentoring program for kids. Um, and then the third part is that there is some data that suggests that people will turn in an old gun that they're not using or that doesn't work and then use the money that they get to go purchase a new gun, um, which is quite problematic for, for obvious reasons. So I think that if you could collect data that addresses those three mm -hmm. critiques that shows that you do see a decrease in firearm deaths, that the guns that you're collecting, right, that the guns that you're collecting are ones that would have otherwise been used to cause harm, that shows that you are um, managing the firearms and the expense and time in a way that does is cost effective. And that shows that the cash that you're giving in that gun buyback is not turning around and being used to purchase a new firearm. I think that if you could address those three, those would be good things because then it would potentially change um, the trajectory. But I will say kind of the uh, preponderance of evidence is that um, Although th that they are something that make us feel really good. And you know what? If that's your criteria, then go for it. Like there's nothing wrong with doing things that make us feel good, right? It's not an inherently bad thing, but that there may be better ways um, to spend our time and money. So, I, but I would love to see more data. Certainly, uh, as with most things in gun violence prevention, um, there's a lot of stuff we don't know yet. Cool. Thank you. Um... Other questions while we're waiting for other questions, I, you know, I just want to highlight and reinforce your points. And I loved the way you framed uh, your talk and making people remember and understand why this is a public health problem and why there's a public health approach to the solution to the problem. Because I think that's a question we get frequently. Uh, we get, we frequently get ask the question, why is this a public health problem? Why is it one that needs a public health solution? Mm -hmm. And I think the point you have been raising is, you know, if you first collect the data, analyze the data, identify risk factors and protective factors, develop and fund interventions, which is part of what this commission is doing, uh, that address those risk factors or protective factors, and then be able to evaluate the outcomes long term. That is what is going to take us forward as a state in terms of, you know, where we get the best bang for our buck in terms of the interventions that we set up. So um, I, I really appreciate uh, the the clarity with which you presented that. Thank you, Manisha, and and, and Dr. Dushani. And there, I'll kind of highlight, and I see Kyle on the call that um, who have known for a very a, a very long time, right? So a nice example here is around kind of the work that he's done to allow us to get reimbursement for those violence intervention workers um, as, right? Because then, so you identify something that we know works in some settings. We say kind of here, so we, we've done kind of collected the data, looked at some of the risk and protective factors, developed an intervention. So we think about scaling it. One of the things that prevents us from scaling it is that we can't pay the people. So how do we create a mechanism to pay it? But then we have to circle back around and say, okay, how do we train folks appropriately? How do we measure outcomes appropriately kind of in amongst those hospital or community-based violence intervention workers? So that, right, in, in, because once we're starting to use Medicare or Medicaid dollars, that we, we have a different um, level of obligation kind of for training and monitoring. And so a, a nice example there is that kind of circle of, of all four of those steps that they're doing um, with the hobby um, to, to address kind of how do we 
gather data, evaluate risk and protective factors, develop interventions that work, implement, and then circle back around again, knowing that we don't stop there, that it's a constant improvement cycle. Right, and that feedback loop is so important. Uh, Dr. Racian. Hi, Dean Rainey. How are you today? Hi, how are you? It's good to see you. It's reminding me I need to send you an email. I, I made a note. Um, so I'm curious about the Ready program in, in Chicago. It's a it's a program I've looked at a lot. Um, I'm curious a couple of about a couple of things. One, in your read of the, the literature and the Ready program, like what is it that makes it effective? If there were if there were things that Connecticut was looking to replicate from that, like yep. what would they prioritize? And and then I guess the other is um so I'm the one of the co-chairs of our data and um, evaluation subcommittee. Yeah. So uh when we think about aggregating data across programs that are you know, they may have similar long-term outcomes, but different short-term outcomes. Are there any sort of um, tips or resources that you might have that could point us into sort of how to do that? Um, and I guess the other thing I'll say that I put in the chat, Dr. Emmy Bess's Firearm Life Plan, uh, which re responds to some of Pina's um, concerns about sort of what to do with a gun if someone in the home has um, either passed away or no longer needs it, or if risks in the home have changed, et cetera. So I found that to be a useful tool. And I just yeah. Want to that. Thank you, Dr. Racy. And then I will add on to the firearm life plan. Um, we're currently, we're doing studies um, for folks with kind of in that. So th with that one, we're kind of seeing how we actually empower caregivers for folks with dementia to have safer storage. Um, also doing a national project um, to create safe storage maps. So if you are in a home where you want to get rid of a firearm, where can you go and kind of drop it off? Um, right, so that rather than having to organize a gun buyback event, um, are you know, can you take it to a police station or you know, et cetera? Um, and, and how do we develop that on a national level? So thank you for for highlighting um, Dr. Betz's work. Uh, to the first question around ready about what makes it successful, um, I, I I would say that kind of for me, it's a couple of different things. One is the commitment to shared data across the entire community is really tremendous, and of course, you know, that goes back to um, uh, oh my goodness, um, the Cardiff model from which kind of had uh, long ago um, in Scotland showing that um, we, when you bring together data from hospitals, from communities and from law enforcement, you get better or more accurate data. And I think one of the challenges that many of us have is that there's you know competition, whether between hospitals or between community-based organizations. And so there's not that sharing of data ready has served as a neutral party to kind of accumulate and share data. And I would say something like DPH could be the same, um, right? So as, as a way to, so that would be the first thing about Ready that I think is um, tremendous. Um, is, is that kind of, that it, that it serves as a place that brings various people together um, from different universities, from different hospitals, from different community groups. Um, the second one is, is that it provides both kind of that uh, individual level support with um, job training, um, with cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of the stuff that I was talking about with my text message program. So there's like individual level, how do you help people change their thought patterns, right? Because folks have grown up with a history of trauma. There's the individual level of how do I give you hope? How do I give you kind of something to step into and mentorship and, and kind of that, that aspect? But then there's the community level, which is that folks in the community know that there's someone out there. And, and again, kind of it's that, it's that provision of hope and the collaboration with the variety of different community-based organizations, each of which have a slightly different model in Chicago. There's a, a lot of different programs out there, um, but which are willing to see each other as uh, amplifying each other's work rather than trying to have one rise up above the other. And so that's the second part of it that I think has been tremendously effective is that it recognizes that each organization in the ecosystem has a role to play um, and trying to help all of the different organizations to do better. And I think to your point, you know, um, having being in the process of setting up our Office of Firearm Injury Prevention within DPH and yeah. hiring people to be able to help that lead that work forward, that is exactly my hope that we're going to be able to serve in that capacity that you're talking about. Um, one question I have uh, that I found very interesting in some of the data you presented was around how 
proven interventions that work in certain communities may not have the same impact in other communities. And this is the multifactorial issue that uh, is true in every state, may even be true that in one municipality is yeah. different than in another municipality. Yeah. And so I'm trying to figure out uh, if you have advice or thoughts on one, if you know anything so far about uh, you know some of our uh, big municipalities in Connecticut. And second, if not, um, what do you think is the best approach to dealing with that unknown? That's a great question. And it's something I spend a lot of time thinking about. And I don't, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't have an answer for. Um, and, and I'll actually look, I'm actually going to look to Kyle here because he spends a ton of time thinking about hospital violence intervention programs across the country. Um, because I don't have an answer. And, and I know this is something that I'm, I'm working with kind of the Javi and with Kaiser Permanente to try to look at kind of how do we actually distinguish what works versus what don't? Can we isolate the elements that are most likely to be successful? But there may be something I don't know of. And so I don't know Kyle or, or Dr. Fisher or Dr. Racy and if either or Dr. Doddington or anyone on the call, actually, I should look around. I don't mean I don't mean to pick out the people that I happen to know. Many of you may have ideas. Um, I don't know uh, of, of great evidence, though, Dr. Jathani. I think it's, thanks Dean Randy. Uh, I, I think it's probably related to a number of different things. So probably like issue number one, two, and maybe even three is implementation of the models and ensuring that they're implemented with fidelity. Um, you know, I see in evaluations fairly often, you know, it'll be, this was our hospital-based violence intervention program. This is our results. But I know personally the authors and I know like they just they're just getting started. I, I didn't even think the fully program was fully up and running yet. But then there's the data in the literature. So there's, you know, that aspect of it. Um, and then, you know, on a totally different set, you know, life on the ground is different in very, very in different places. So particularly important for things like group violence intervention or street interruption. You know, for example, you know, gang culture in the United States is widely different around the country. You know, you when people hear about gang violence, I think most people think of like Los Angeles in the early 90s, and there are these major gangs with major kind of hierarchical organizations, but that is really not what is happening on the ground in most places. And, you know, in Chicago, for example, when you hear law enforcement talk about gangs, they'll say there's like over 1,000 gangs in the city. And well, at that point, it's, you know, small little neighborhood cliques rather than what you traditionally think of things, but it's something in between throughout the country. So um, my impression is that it's kind of a combination of local factors and then implementation factors and many others, but I'm sure there's lots of explanations too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I think traditionally in all research, we know the difference between efficacy, which is, you know, in that controlled model uh, where you conduct a trial versus effectiveness in the real world. We know that that, I mean, that's basically what you're talking about, that distinction, and also the fidelity to the model, what people talk about. But I do think this, this issue of the very regional and factors in a given community which may be of a certain flavor at one moment in time and 20 years later may be different, you know? And so just because it worked then, it, it may not work later. It's possible yeah. though, as that dynamic changes. So I think that's that, that's probably a good way to think about it. Um, go ahead, Dr. Racine, do you have another question? No, I was just gonna add on, like it may not necessarily be temporal validity or even fidelity to the model. Sometimes interventions literally just have different effects for different people. And given the different kind of variation that we see in gun violence and how it's it's a, you know, Dr. Rainey went through a whole bunch of different ways that this exists. I just reviewed um, some different RCTs in the domestic violence space last night for a different report. And it was a study done across seven sites, the process validity was actually pretty good, but there are mixed results, not because they did it differently across seven sites, but because those seven sites were made up of different populations. And 
So I think we also have to be careful and acknowledge what works in one group might not work in another. And so, um, and, and to Dr. Rainey's part, earlier point, like we want to do it, what works, but we certainly don't want to do what causes harm. And so I just think there's a lot to be learned from replication studies. And so, um, but, but there are lots of reasons why we might not get an effect that's constant across sites. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nelva. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this commission. Um, this is probably something everyone on the call knows. So uh, I do want to apologize, I guess, if, but I, I do feel like I need to say it in every space. It has been my experience for 11 years that much of this conversation happens absent of survivors and those working most closely to the issues that people are thinking a lot about, but don't actually live in the same way as folks who live in communities um, like the one where I grew up in. I'm a graduate of Hartford Public High School. I'm not just a Newtown mom. Um, and part of the reason I accepted the position at Yale after swearing I would never go back to academia is because I wanted to be more of a link between those spaces and the people who are actually living them in ways that I remember um, from growing up in Hartford. So I do encourage folks on this call to please um, connect with me as I connect uh, to the research team at Yale. And also to keep in mind, even on this call, I, I just wanna, I, I see my friends, I see people who've been working on this issue far before Newtown with very limited resources and a huge gap in empathy. The truth is nobody cared when black moms were saying our kids are dying. So when we were calling it if public health or not, People were saying, this is impacting us, and nobody cared until Newtown. As, and as someone and as a family, I get very emotional about this because it was incredibly difficult for us to live both in a space where we lost a child in a mass shooting, but to know what it's like to grow up in the spaces where nobody cares. It's just incredibly important that we offer space to that, acknowledge that in the room, and continue to do the work, all of us together and in lockstep, because every day, there are a hundred and some odd more people joining us and it is hell to continue. So mm -hmm. thank you for this commission and for this time. Thank you. And I know that as many of you know, we have many people who share uh, stories like you do who are on this call and that is the precise reason this commission was set up. Um, so uh, Melissa. Uh, good morning. Uh, first, I want to introduce myself and, and say hello um, to Dean Rainey and Dr. Giussani. Uh, I'm Melissa Kane, and I'm representing CAGV moment for the moment uh, mm -hmm. and happy to be joining this commission for the time being. Um, sort of to Nelba's point, but I wanted to get back to something that uh, and ask a question about something uh, Dean Rainey was talking about, uh, the importance of enforcement in education we, as you said, we looked at the maps, Connecticut has been able to pass certain laws specifically in the last few years, uh, ERPO and safe storage laws. How, and I guess the, I guess my question is, as we look at what, what Nelbo was saying and what everyone's saying, clearly different communities re react differently to different messaging. So how yeah. do we come up with clear messaging that works how do, how, how do we evaluate that data? How do we disseminate that data? So we make sure as we try to educate, as we need to be doing on these important laws that really are important to all communities. Yeah. Uh, so that's one question for you. And the other was you were talking about suicide rates. I mean, I don't think it's dipped below 50% in the last 10 years in Connecticut for percentage of gun, you know deaths from gun uh, violence. So, you know, still way up there. So just your thoughts on that. Absolutely. Please. So thank you. Um, so the first one around communications. So this this has been my kind of much of my body of work for, for I didn't talk a lot about it kind of during the talk, but um, so we talk about kind of an injury prevention that there are four E's. Um, there is enforcement, there's economics, there's engineering, and then there's education. Education is critical. Because we had not approached firearm injury from a public health problem for 24 years, as a public health problem for 24 years, we have minimal research on what types of messages are most likely to resonate with what communities. 
I will acknowledge that there is a very strong marketing campaign out there that is pro-firearm as something to protect you and your family that has been in existence for about 24 years, which has shifted the norms and the beliefs of many folks across the United States, regardless of what community they live in. When you do surveys of gun owners, whether they are urban or rural, they say that they own a firearm in order to protect themselves, which was not true 20 years ago, right? 20 years ago, people owned a firearm for hunting, for shooting, because it was a family tradition, right? So, so the proportion that say that it's to protect themselves has dramatically increased over the last two decades. How we pull that back and kind of educate, how we educate about risk, how we educate about safe storage, to me is one of the greatest challenges of our time. The data that we have suggests that how we do that has to be tailored. If I go back to that kind of social ecological model, it has to be tailored according to the community that you live in. One of my colleagues, a guy named Mike Anestis, who's down at um, uh, Rutgers in New Jersey, has done outstanding work looking at what messaging is most likely to resonate um, with veterans and with the military, um, with gun owner, with kind of rural run, gun owner groups in Mississippi, and showing that for them, physician or a healthcare provider is actually not the most trusted source for them if law enforcement officers or military, right? Very different results if we look at um, Black boys or young men um, living in an urban community where folks overestimate the proportion of folks in their community who own a firearm, but say that they want to acquire one because they want to be protected, right? The messaging there is going to be very different. Um, and then a topic that Dr. Racian and I have been talking about is kind of what about new communities that are purchasing firearms? We're seeing increasing rates of firearm purchasing among women, younger people, LGBTQ plus folks, um, uh, right? So we're seeing changes in the demographics because of a belief that I needed to protect myself from whatever coming civil dysfunction is ahead. Um, and so the messaging there is gonna be different as well. So it's a short, that's a long way of saying, it's clear that there need to be different types of messages for different groups. And those need to come from different types of people but there's a lot of work to do. And I think the best thing that we can do is to start trying it, but again, to make sure that we're gathering data on the other side. The thing that I don't want is for our rush to do something to, like we shouldn't slow down what we're doing because of the desire to collect data, right? I, that's not what I'm advocating. However, we should not have the rush to do something, get in the way of making sure that we're, what we're doing is not causing harm or hopefully is actually helping, right? And, and I often cite the D.A.R.E. program, which I'm looking around this room. Many of us are of the age where we took part in the D.A.R.E. program in middle or high school. And studies have since shown that kids that took part in the D.A.R.E. program actually have higher rates of substance use than kids that didn't, right? So an example of like, it, it becomes, um, yeah, it, it, we should do things, but we should make sure we're looking at it on, on the other side. Unless it's good to thank you for saying hi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. And I will say, I'm going to have to go in a couple of minutes just because I yes. actually have to run a meeting at 10 15. So I apologize. Yes, absolutely. I was going to say, I think we need to wrap up and go on to our next uh, presentations uh, as well. Mm -hmm. But I'll uh, end with Susan Logan. Mm -hmm. Susan, you want to, you can. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I was going to take it later. Um, hi, I'm Susan Logan. I work here at DPH and I am the uh, director of the injury violence surveillance unit here. Awesome. And uh, yeah. Thank you for the uh, the talk. It was really interesting, and uh, and yeah, I re I relate to a lot of the work that you have been doing because we've been doing this for a while since. Um, gosh, we've been collecting homicide data since yeah. twenty fifteen. Your and, BDRS is yes, was the BDRS. The early one, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, so we're finally you know getting into this space where we're thinking mm -hmm. about prevention because we've been collecting this data forever, mm -hmm. and oh my gosh, it's finally you know happening and. Hopefully the CDC will start um, providing some funding for uh, prevention initiatives. They have started in, with suicide prevention. So we're looking at firearms with suicide prevention, um, you know, but hopefully um, more funding will be provided by the CDC to do violence and, and firearm violence prevention. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so I want to just get back to the differences and effectiveness of the um, the different initiatives across communities. And I do want to say um, to Nelba's point that we have um, these community-based organizations now that we're funding. We have people in the commission here who are from the community, who work in the communities, work with those who with those um, people in the community um, and live in those communities. So hopefully we're getting that benefit um, of uh, of their knowledge and experience in their communities. 
Um, so hoping to, you know, with the work, money that we're providing and the technical assistance that we're providing, um, you know, helping them to augment the work that they're doing and, and perhaps start new programs. We are encouraging evidence-based, evidence-informed initiatives. And, um, you know, and, and they're looking at the, evaluating the results. And if they, you know, are not effective, then maybe trying something else that we can help fund. So, you know, I think, you know, with this commission, I think that's the value of this commission is really right. thinking about, yeah, the different, um, you know, people here and what we can help provide and uh, really help our communities. And getting another thing with the data, um, I just sent something to, it is 29% of suicides are firearm suicides. And there has been a significant increase um, since uh, since COVID um, between 2019 from, sorry, from 2020 to 2022, we basically doubled the rate of firearm homicides in the state, uh, which is really concerning. And so hopefully this commission and the, um, the funded community-based organizations will help you know, decrease that. So I just wanted to make those points. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. And and as I'm looking around the screen, kind of the kind of Hollywood squares people are moving, I do want to acknowledge also Connecticut Children's, um, which I didn't, Brandon Campbell, who I've worked with, who's a trauma surgeon, um, is doing some really nice work around firearm messaging there as well. Um, and they've got a lovely injury prevention program. Um, so I just, and, and I know that there are many others on here who I can't see because of the way that the thing looks. And I just want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing. Um, I know that I am new here. You have lived here, some of you for your entire lives, but certainly all of you for longer than I have. Um, and so to know that I come and kind of give this talk with humility and uh, a desire to partner and to help lift up um, the work that many of you have dedicated your life to um, and that you see, you know, your communities affected by. Um, so I, I look forward to learning from and with you um, and to, to working together to create a healthier Connecticut. Um, so thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you joining us. And of course, you're welcome to stay, but I know you have another meeting. Thank so you. thanks yeah. again for coming. Um, and we'll move on uh, to the next item on our agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, our media campaign uh, design update. So um, Colleen, I'll turn it over to you. And um, just remind everybody, we do have until 11 o'clock for this meeting. So we will make it through the rest of our agenda. Uh, but go ahead, Colleen. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I think this segues very well into our media campaign, um, taking into account what we all just learned from this wonderful presentation. We'll be taking, I took tons and tons of notes, so we'll be incorporating a lot of that back into the media campaign as well. But just to kind of give a brief overview, um, back in the early, um, early fall, late summer, we sent out a survey to all of the commission members. Um, we're working with the O'Donnell Company to um, design a media campaign and back it out our October meeting, we had a presentation from the O'Donnell Company um, providing us feedback, and now we're going to be getting another update from the O'Donnell Company um, on the next phase of uh, the creation of the campaign, our landing page, and get some feedback on some potential URL link uh, naming. So I'm going to turn it over to John Paul Grego from the O'Donnell Company. Hi, Colleen. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for uh, letting me join this group again. I, I do appreciate it, and I'm uh, very thankful I was able to be here for uh, Dean Rainey's presentation, because as uh, echoing what Colleen just said, it is incredibly helpful for us to hear this data firsthand. So um, appreciate that. Um, as Colleen mentioned, last time we met, we we kind of walked through the overall strategic approach um, of the campaign for community gun violence prevention intervention. Um, since that time, we've been working closely with the DPH team, not only to develop um, content for new website, but more importantly, we've been working on establishing the overall brand identity for this program, um, determining what the overall brand theme is going to be, the, the go-to-market name, call to action, uh, the website address that we're gonna use, some of those details to really bring this to life. So that's what we wanna to review today. I realize there are a lot of other topics that you uh, have to cover today, so I will try and go through some of this as quick as I can here and speed it up a little bit. Um, quickly, just want to um, kind of jump back and take a look at the objectives for this campaign because they are extremely relevant to what we're going to look at today. Um, main priority here uh, of the campaign efforts that we're working on and the marketing efforts is to um, introduce this idea of community gun violence as a public health issue, um, talking about what that means, how it affects residents, what the data is that supports that, um, which is so important. Obviously, this group understands the idea of gun violence as a public health issue and gets that. Um, 
but it's a new concept to most individuals and, and to kind of general population. So introducing them to that idea. Um, secondly, a part of that is really talking about the different factors and issues that play a role in gun violence. And we talked about a lot of them today. Um, you know, this crosses ev over everything from substance abuse to mental health issues, racial disparities, safe storage, domestic violence. There's a lot of topics that kind of funnel into the issue of gun violence, and, and we, we kind of want to address all of those. Um, and then I think the most important part of what we're developing in this campaign is providing support and resources for those affected by gun violence. Um, you know, this includes not only talking about the seven programs that are going to be funded by this effort, but really shining a light on a lot of the other community organizations in the state that are doing amazing work. And we kind of want to become a compendium um, and a, and a you know, consolidated resource for people to find different services and help in their specific communities for different issues that that they're they're dealing with that again funnel into the larger issue of gun violence. Um, and then ultimately the goal is to increase intervention prevention um, so that we can hopefully lower the incidence of gun violence within the state. So moving into creative development, um, there are four main things that we want to go through today and that we're kind of focused on working on immediately for this campaign. First is establishing a brand identity. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that kind of comes down to a name and logo for this. And the, um, you know, Community Gun Violence Intervention and Prevention Program is the formal name. It is a mouthful. Um, so really looking at trying to find something that, uh, you know, how do we wrap our messaging in a more user-friendly identity? that clearly quickly states our focus, easy to remember, ties in with our call to action and what we want people to do. So that's a big part of, of what we're gonna look at today. Um, when we talk about that call to action, that really is the dedicated website that we're gonna be developing for this effort and for this program. Where do we wanna send people? What's the name of that, that URL? How does it tie in with the rest of the campaign? Um, we're gonna be looking at the brand theme third here. Um, that's really just the look, feel, the tone of the campaign. What are the colors we're using? Um, what's the imagery that we're showing? What's the tone that we want this to have? Is it is it somber? Is it positive and upbeat? Um, you know, how do all of those come together to present the full campaign look and feel? And then lastly is the website design itself, um, taking that brand theme and actually bringing it to life in a website that's informative, easy to navigate, so those are the elements that we're going to be looking at today. Quickly, I'll run through this because, again, I know we're limited on time. Um, O'Donnell, as a part of this effort, we did an audit of more than 20 state and national organizations tied to gun violence. We looked at their websites. We looked at their messaging. We wanted to find um, both consistencies and differences in the way that different organizations are talking about gun violence, talking about the issues, what actions are they asking people to take, what resources are they providing. Um, so, you know, that's helpful for us to see to kind of help focus our message and, and our direction, the approach that we want to take. There were a lot of interesting trends that we saw, as you can imagine, um, extremely wide range, you know, on the spectrum of highly political to nonpartisan. Um, we saw some campaigns that were completely, you know, led with a loud political charge. Others that had no clear political affiliation or agenda and everything in between. But you see this, this incredibly large spectrum, as you'd imagine, with a topic such as this. Um, most of the messages of these organizations tended to fall into two categories. They were either very emotionally charged or it was more straightforward, fact-based information sharing. Um, most kind of fell into those two categories. Um, many of the websites that we looked at didn't have a clear explanation of what action they wanted individuals to take. And, and that was one of the bigger concerns we saw with a lot of the organizations that we interacted with. Um, you know, some defaulted to donate or volunteer as kind of a catch all of here's what we're asking you to do. Um, the other half had very sp specific directives. Um, focused more usually on political action, lobbying, marching, contacting your local politicians. There were some that that had both and and kind of did the volunteer donate and the you know take action. Um, but most of them kind of split into those two categories. 
very few are looking at gun violence from a public health perspective. Um, and I, I think that's a big differentiator of, of what this program is. Again, most of those aren't, most of those organizations aren't being developed or backed by a Department of Public Health. Um, they have a lot of different sources, but um, that public health perspective is a major differentiator. Few focused on youth intervention. Um, and, and I know that's, that's a very big topic and big concern of, of what this group is focused on and what we want to make sure we're um, discussing. There were a few that leaned into kind of single issue focuses. Safe storage suicide was a big one. There were a couple of organizations that that was clearly their specific message, their directive, their their um, message that they wanted to get out there. So this kind of helps to guide our path a little bit and and focus on on what we want our identity to be. Um, so having talked with with the DPH team and kind of gone through this, you know, we want to avoid partisan or politically charged direction. We don't, our campaign is is hopefully about creating positive change. Um, and, and that's not going to happen by us rolling in the mud and getting into political arguments through this campaign. So that's, that's not what we want to do here. Um, we want to focus on public health facts to guide the narrative. Um, again, just the fact that we're approaching this as a public health issue is a is a huge differentiator, and it sets the tone for a more fact-based narrative and fact-based campaign. Um, third, uh, we want to be real about gun violence and the issues uh, in our state that can get very heavy very quickly, and, and we all realize the, the severity of what we're talking about. Um, so we want to balance that with messages of hope and positivity. That's that's a big focus of ours in developing this campaign. Um, we don't want to add weight to individuals that are, you know, already dealing with other issues. We don't want to make people feel bad because of where they live or other issues they might be facing. We want to provide them with a path to help and a path to hope. So that's a big focus on our end from a marketing standpoint. Um, and then last, this effort is going to take a much broader approach to the issues and factors that are influencing gun violence. Um, we learned quickly through our research and through the survey we did with the group, you know, the issue of gun violence can't be boiled down uh, into one topic or one source. It really is a culmination of many public health issues affecting many different audiences all at the same time. And we want to make sure we're addressing all of those issues and speaking to all of them. So, um, you know, starting to see how this comes to life on the following pages, as Colleen mentioned, we're going to show you um, some design themes for this campaign, um, some initial naming options, some logo designs, knowing that the website is going to be an important foundational part of this. We are going to start to show how some of these different cam campaign elements come to life in a mock-up of a website homepage, so you can start to see the realities of this campaign and what it looks like. Um, and as we discussed, pre discussed previously, there's um, a need for these to all kind of live under a more consumer friendly name. Um, we want that name to easily work as an explanation for what this program stands for, the action we want people to take. Um, but we also want it to tie in with a as a functional call to action as a website address. So trying to find something that can um, check all of those boxes is a goal of, of kind of this naming brand exercise. So here is the theme that was selected by um, the DPH and commissioner's office. It is called Pulse of the City. Um, what you're looking at here is, is what we call a brand board. Um, and it just kind of gives an overall picture of, of the color palette, the design elements, the, the graphics and imagery that we'd be using in this campaign. Um, as you can see, very vibrant, energetic. Most importantly, it feels optimistic. Uh, we talked about that hope and that that being a source for help. Um, bold colors and images that really capture this kind of vibrant youth culture. Um, it has a sense of, sense of energy, a sense of momentum. I think what was most important to us, and a lot of people had this reaction when they saw this, this particular theme, it has a sense of community. Um, it feels like uh, it, it is a community that you're looking at when you look at this design theme. Um, so that's the overall look and feel. 
And on the next slide, we start to see how that theme, as I mentioned, comes to life in you know a rough mock-up of a of a website homepage. Um, in this, you see the color palette, the design elements, some of the graphics, the colors all coming to life here with the imagery. And you see one of the first naming uh, logo options that that we're going to um, walk the group through, which is prevent gun violence CT. Um, you know, uh, talking before about the brand and the website and that call to action all tying together, this name logo option would use the web address preventgunviolencect.org as the primary call to action. So all of that is tying together. Um, and it might be small for everyone to see on screen. I don't know if you could actually read the, the navigation in the top green bar there. Um, but this site, we envision breaking into three you know, main sections for the launch of this. And, and I think part of the discussion today, you know, makes us all realize this is going to need to be organic and a living thing that grows over time as the commission grows and as different programs grow and interventions are added and there's new data to share. So this website is going to be built to grow and expand. But for the initial launch, we want to have these three main sections. Um, the first would be a public health page that focus on discussing the facts around dealing with gun violence as a public health issue and introducing again, that, that idea. Um, the centerpiece of the site is that second section, the resources um, where we want people to be able to, to search for help and support in their community. That would be where we would have the seven, again, the seven funded programs uh, through this effort would live there but also wanna have a kind of major list of different organizations throughout the, the state organized by their focus. So there could be youth intervention programs, there could be community outreach programs, um, substance abuse, domestic violence, all of those can live and, and we can kind of build that as an accordion drop down menu where if you click on one of those topics, you can get a list of all different programs throughout the state and in your area where you can get support and help. Um, and then the last part of this section would be dedicated to introducing the commission, talking about the missions and the mission and goals of the commission. Um, again, I think we'd want to highlight those seven programs um, that can, again, can obviously expand over time. But that's what we're envisioning for sort of the general breakout of the website. And on this next slide, you can see some of the other name logo options that um, we've been exploring throughout this exercise. Um, yeah, this is where we'd love to get some thoughts from the group and some input from this group. In We've reviewed lots of different names, lots of different logo options throughout this process. We had kind of narrowed it down to these three, um, Prevent Gun Violence CT, as you saw on the previous slide, Safer CT, and then the third one is end firearm violence CT. And that third um, version, the end firearm violence CT, that's that's kind of a nod to the Office of Firearm Inj Injury Prevention, which is in development. Um, you know, there are some concerns when we've had discussions internally. We love how how this logo looks. Um, I, uh, the the design themes for these. There has been some discussion on you know firearms are often uh synonymous with law enforcement or there's more of a of a sense of law enforcement when you're talking about firearms so um again would love to get the thoughts from the group on if and if the tone of what we're speaking about changes when we reference firearms versus guns um and then below there's a few additional names that you know had come out um sort of to the top of this exercise when we were discussing we really chose these three to develop further and create some logos for but there were a couple of other names that that we all really liked and and at least wanted to share with the group um uproot gun violence was one that we thought played really nice off the kind of community grassroot um you know aspect of this program uh take a stand ct was another one Gun Safe CT, and then Stop Gun Violence CT. And again, all of these, you know, at the time that we were developing these names, developing these logos, all of these had available website URLs that we could purchase um, for, you know, gunsafect.org, stopgunviolencect.org. So we'd want to pair that all together. So, so there's some synergy between the name, the logo, the web address. Um, I've got one other slide after this, but I don't know if we want to kind of 
stop here and, and open up to the group and, and get some thoughts first before we move on. Yeah, and I just want to, I know we're kind of short on time. We do have another presenter right after, but we will be sending all of the names because this is where we're looking to have a lot of the feedback from the commission, obviously on the design as well. Um, but we really want to have the input from the commission on the name. So what we'll do is we'll put together a doodle poll and send it out and then you can vote on um, what your favorite name is. So we will follow up with that. But um John, John Paul, if you just want to go to the next slide, and then we can just ask for feedback via email. And if there's anything pressing, we can maybe run, uh, circle back to it at the end of the um, meeting as well. Yeah, thank you. I, I Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not sure what your next steps are. I do want to make sure um, we uh, get to the rest of our agenda. But was your next steps, uh, John Paul, more mostly on the feedback piece? Or was there any other imagery you wanted to show? Just so, so just a couple of things I want to cover here. And again, we can get feedback on the logos, I, I think, after um, afterwards here. Um, but, you know, number one on the list is selecting that brand identity and URL, um, right. continuing the construction of the new website that is in development right now. We're working on content. You see the designs that are already in place. So we're working on building that. Um, a media plan is being finalized right now as we speak, um, looking to launch that April of 2024. So all of this is tying together. That we're planning on being a combination of kind of a statewide splash and making sure that we're getting messaging and media out there that um, is being seen statewide while at the same time having some initiatives that are hyper-targeted um, at the audiences that we wanna make sure we're reaching the you know, young black Hispanic males um, in specific communities, looking at Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, Stamford. So a combination of letting everyone know, but also making sure that we are getting very focused and targeted um, on the audiences that are most affected. Um, heavy push on social media. We'd be looking at Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok for all of this to make sure we're reaching all the different age audiences. Um, and then the final piece of this is we'll just be building based on that final um, media plan, we'll be building the final creative assets. So social media posts, videos, banner ads, billboards. So all of this is in development right now, but it all kind of ties in with getting that brand identity approved, selecting that name. And, and that's the final piece of the puzzle here to really uh, push forward to the finish line. Great. Thank you so much for that um, and uh, really appreciate your work on this. I did put a couple of uh, links in the chat because Colorado um, is a state that is specifically addressing this as a public health problem through their public health department. Uh, they have a specific website. I don't know if that's something that people have seen um, and the de department's website and then their uh, Let's Talk Guns uh, website as well. So just wanted to share that if with people want to take a look at it um, as they uh, fill out the poll uh, that Colleen sends out. So thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn it over now to Sasa Harriet, who has a presentation for us as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, everyone. We should be able to share the screen. Okay. Good morning, esteemed members of the Commission on Gun Violence, Intervention and Prevention. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about home health care perspective and to highlight areas of improvement in the current HVIP model. My name is Sasa Harriet. I am a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, board certified, and the CEO of Harriet Home Health Services a joint commission accredited and state licensed home health care agency committed to improving the outcomes for our patients, their families, and our communities. We pride ourselves on treating patients, including victims of community violence who are often overlooked and underserved. Today, I will review my concerns that we have as home health care workers with the current implementation of the HVIP model in Connecticut and the impact on public health, patients, and the community. I'll start by providing some background on our agency. Harriet Home Health Services, established in 2011, we have been steadfast in our mission to provide medical care to individuals who often fall through the cracks of our healthcare system. We treat patients regardless of their insurance status, location, or circumstance. 
We have been recognized for our commitment to go where many other nurses and healthcare agencies simply will not. Harriet Home Health Services treats patients in high crime neighborhoods and those who are unhoused. We believe everyone deserves high quality care, no matter their zip code. Harriet Home Health Services is a comprehensive home care agency that offers a wide range of servicing, services encapsulating both health care and comprehensive wraparound support. From healthcare and behavioral health to violence intervention, insurance application assistance, and psychosocial needs evaluations, our commitment to improving health outcomes extend beyond medical care. The home health care model is centered around bringing health care for professionals into the patient's home where they can be assessed for immediate concerns, triaged for medical needs, where they can be assessed for underlying health conditions. Home health care allows clinicians to provide quality care in the patient's most comfortable environment, alleviating much of the stress of short and long-term recovery. Home care also allows licensed medical professionals to oversee and assist in a patient's recovery after they have been discharged from an acute setting. This not only ensures better health outcomes, but also eases the caregiving burden on family members and particularly those affected by community violence. Now that you know more about who we are, I'll move on to why I've come before you today. While the current HVIP model aims to support victims of community violence, it falls short in crucial areas. Today under the HVIP system, hospitals call non-medical community partners to the bedside of patients who are victims of community violence. These partners provide emotional support and assist with the discharge transition in essence they oversee a patient's post-discharge care. While on paper, this may seem effective, relying on non-medical HVIP community members to coordinate a patient's post-hospital care can jeopardize the patient's health and recovery. The reality is that these partners often call home care agencies days after a patient is discharged. As non-medical professionals, they cannot accurately assess a patient's condition to provide us with the information that we need, including medical conditions, medication history, pre-existing conditions, and the like. Instead of getting information directly from a treating physician, we are receiving secondhand accounts and trying to piece things together and understand what the patient needs in order to provide the necessary care. To put it simply, the current HVIP model is an unfortunate game of telephone, which puts the patient's health and recovery at risk. In addition to the gaps in the current HVIP model, many patients who are victims of community violence also have to contend with a host of assumptions made by the hospitals. We know that no two patients are the same, even those who may have similar conditions and injuries. A higher income patient being discharged home to Avon is in a far different situation than a low income patient being discharged, for example, to Hartford's North End. We sometimes show up and the door is blown off and the patient lacks the resources to even repair the door. When a patient is discharged, a hospital may assume that the patient is not only returning to safe conditions, but that they have the economic resources to provide adequate wound care. Hospitals may also assume that the patient has the capacity to follow complicated instructions, which can disproportionately impact non-English speakers and those with severe mental health conditions. Many victims of community violence also lack the support, whether financial, emotional, or psychological, to navigate not only short-term care, but to ensure their long-term recovery as well. As I mentioned, 
relying on non-medical HVIP community members to effectively be the sole managing support system for patients discharge care can negatively impact his or her health outcome. Over the years, my team and I have had countless situations and heard stories of inequities that victims of community violence face. Many victims are discharged without an adequate discharge plan or referral to additional medical services. Once hospitals call in the community HVIP partner to pay to the patient's bedside, a handoff occurs between the hospital and that community partner, leaving many standard processes to fall through the cracks. Many victims of community violence, especially people of color from high crime areas, experience a rushed or premature discharge as hospitals have an unfounded fear that the community violence will follow the patient. This leaves many patients unprepared for the challenges they'll face after they've been discharged. Sadly, it's only the beginning of many unfounded assumptions that victims face, including the assumptions that they themselves, the victims of violence and their families are dangerous criminals also. The realities and challenges that these patients and their families face from systemic inequities and gaps in care it's a well-intended HVIP model, but it can cause real consequences, both short-term and long-term, as you will see from the following patient examples. First, we will look at patient A. Patient A is a stark reminder of the consequences of the inadequate discharge planning. A victim of gun violence was discharged from a local emergency department without a discharge plan. His family attempted to pack his wounds with sanitary napkins. The patient was then rehospitalized with an infected wound, a wound that had maggots riddled throughout, and he ended up having to have his leg amputated. This was a costly outcome that could have been prevented with adequate discharge planning, which also included the proper transition from the hospital to a home care agency. Patient B is another example. This patient faced additional trauma due to the lack of follow-up and medical services. The patient was initially hospitalized due to multiple puncture wounds and upon discharge was not offered home care services. Initially, she was temporarily housed in a hotel with her two children and referred to a non-medical HVIP partner. The community HVIP partner then took the victim and her children back to the original place where she was uh, um, victimized. She was then re-victimized again by the same individual. Not only was she re-hospitalized, she then became unhoused. Her children became unhoused. DCF became involved. The children were removed. And not only is she currently trying to battle a lengthy legal process, she's trying to heal from the trauma. The intersectionality between violence and healthcare demands a more comprehensive approach. Our goal is to do no harm. Our goal is to ensure veracity. Our goal is to ensure justice and accountability. Incident reporting for um, the patient in A and B, we want to know what systems are in place for the adequate incident reporting of these situations so that we can all learn from these incidences and do better in the future. Community HVIP partners lack medical expertise. They call for medical support days after a patient is discharged. By the time nurses arrive, medical intervention has been significantly delayed. The consequences of delayed medical care are severe, including an increased risk of worsening conditions, rehospitalizations, amputation, and even death. 
This delay places additional physical, financial, and psychological burdens on patients and their families with larger societal ramifications, such as loss of jobs and absence from school. These ripple effects harm families, communities, and society at a large. It is therefore imperative that we address the root of these issues to ensure better and long lasting health outcomes. The current HVIP model lacks a crucial element for lasting success, continuous medical coverage and home health care. A recent area of concern is the use of Yukon family medicine and medical students with a local HVIP partner to go into the homes of victims, um, survivors of gun violence and have students provide care. I would like to know which DPH regulation and policy covers this model and how this new model will ensure individuals receive the ADL and IADL care that they deserve. When victims of violence, um, who may have a spinal cord injury become incontinent of urine, stool, or need to be fed, who will provide that care? Who will ensure the victim receives physical therapy and answer calls about their change in status 24 seven? According to the CMS conditions of participation, hospitals must have an effective discharge planning process. And according to Department of Public Health, the practice of nursing by a registered nurse should be executed under the direction of a licensed practitioner, such as a physician or an advanced practice registered nurse. Relying on non-medical community response teams hinders the provision of adequate discharge plans and prevents home health care nurses from receiving direct orders from treating physicians. This limitation prevents the current HVIP model from achieving its immediate and long-term goals for community violence survivors. In summary, the current HVIP partnership is missing essential components for the lasting health outcomes of gun violence survivors. Victims of community violence need ongoing medical support, continuous home health care, and comprehensive discharge plans. Victims of community violence deserve high quality, ethical care. It's time to reevaluate and refine the existing HVIP model to bridge this critical gap. In terms of the next steps, I respectfully ask the commission to schedule a follow-up meeting to discuss how we can collaboratively fix this gap in the current HVIP model. By implementing proven and effective strategies, we can address the healthcare inequities that victims of community violence face and help ensure that the HVIP model achieves the outcomes it intended to. Before I conclude, I would like to open the floor to any concerns, questions regarding the, the proposed solutions. And I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much for that thought-provoking uh, presentation, uh, Sasa. And if you could maybe stop sharing uh, screen, thank you. Um, I certainly could ask many questions, but I want to open it up to the group and see if anybody has any, uh, any of our commission members um, have any responses to uh, the presentation that was offered today. Actually, yes. Um, can I? I'd like to um, respond. Go ahead, Jackie. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for the presentation. I um, really wanted to clarify a couple of things in the presentation um, because I think it's really important that we're able to look at it from the lens of what a community partner does and um, and the HVIP model that we had in place and the successes that we've been able to have as a, a, with this model. Uh, we definitely have and continue to work with uh, or have worked with Harriet Home Healthcare in the past because we see that there is a need for both the medical and um, the uh, prevention efforts that we're doing or the intervention methods that we're doing bedside. 
when the hospital violence inter, um, in, uh, specialist comes to the hospital, they're really looking from the CBO's perspective to provide an advocate, to provide a mentor, some wraparound services to prevent retaliation in the community. And that is really the purpose of that HVIP uh, specialist coming into the bedside. Medical care has always been respected and we um, rely upon the discharge orders of a medical professional um, to provide those. And when there has been a need for that in-home care, we uh, have referred out to um, Harriet Home Healthcare. Um, and we are also using um, Yukon Medical Center proudly because they um, have been able to um, have doctors visit with us um, at, at, the, at the homes. And so uh, there is an opportunity here to build and build together um, to create a better uh, program um, and make sure that we're honoring both the medical pieces and the pieces that come from the uh, CBOs involved in this. And you know, if there are any of our uh, hospital partners who would like to respond, I think um, could, they could add also their perspective on this. But I just wanted to make sure that we have some clarity on that. Thank you, Jackie. Other comments? Thanks. I, I just want to make kind of one clarifying comment. Um, I, I think we, everyone agrees that there needs to be, you know, for good, strong community violence intervention, you need to have a great like hand in glove relationship between uh, community based organizations and medical organizations, uh, and that they have to work together and collaboratively to make sure that the plan is strong and everyone can work together to make sure that it happens. Um, I, I think one thing that did um, stand out to me in the presentation though, um, that is a little concerning to me is, um, I did feel like you interchangeably used the term HVIP and really just regular hospital medical care. So for example, in the uh, example of someone discharged from the hospital, um, you know, from the emergency department uh, without a follow-up plan, that would have been a patient that was not in uh, HVIP, right? So that is just our legacy in our nation of really poor standard best practices for medical care of violently injured patients that we need to like elevate and get better. Um, but that wouldn't be part of an HVIP if the patient was discharged without any plans. So. I would just be careful to make sure that we're not lumping together the totally inadequate and unacceptable standard of medical care with HVIPs, which elevates what that, you know, some of these near misses are. Thank you. Uh, Janice? I think Sasa raised her hand. I'll let her go first. Thanks, Janice. So now that we all um, agree that HVIP partners should not be arranging discharge planning, because there's multiple articles out, there's one even from NBC last week that the hospital is using the HVIP as the middleman to connect patients to care, and I can send that article. What's the plan going forward since the current HVIP plan lacks nursing at the bedside to discharge patients home. I would like to know that plan. And then now that the HVIP partners won't be connecting victims to nursing, is the hospital gonna ensure of that? Or can we still expect text messages or calls? So we're trying to point out a problem. And Kyle, I understand what you're saying that it's unimaginable that someone would need to continuously reuse the emergency room, right? Um, we know that some victims have chronic conditions and they're already connected to HVIP partners in the community after they're discharged. We understand that. But while that's happening, why is it that nurses, we can't receive information 
from the hospital directly? And why are we now confusing the HVIP model with discharge planning and connecting victims to medical services? Why do we have a HVIP model that's medical to H? VIP community partners instead of medical to medical, and then the victims can be connected to a provider to ensure that their trauma services are received. Because if we look at the Maslow's hierarchy, we have to make sure that we adhere to the DPH regulations. I respect the regulations presented by DPH for home health providers, and we follow that. When we're getting random text messages and calls, three, four days after someone's home by HVIP partners, we're just as confused as you are. So I really hope that we can get together with hospitals to discuss where the gaps are and how can we help. You know, if there's a lack of resources, as was stated in the NBC article, which is why we're now using the middleman, let's discuss how we can find the resources to ensure that the proper people are bedside to connect victims to the medical care that they deserve to maintain their life. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just want to be respectful of a few things. So we are, uh, I'm going to, I know there are three people with hands up. We've got five minutes left of the meeting. Um, I did allow for 25 minutes on this uh, presentation. Um, and so I just want to uh, make one comment, which is this is a very uh, loaded topic and there are very provocative things that have been raised. I think um, Dr. Doddington, part of the new subcommittee, um, I think is to really take on this, uh, this challenge. So this is sort of laying out one of the problems that currently exists, but I don't think we're gonna solve it in the meeting today. So I'm gonna give it to you for a moment and then be able to finish up with CCMC and our last few agenda items. Dr. Doddington. Thanks so much, Commissioner. Um, Janice and Sasa, thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to see you again. I was very pleased, and it should be noted, um, that your presentation at the state capitol uh, was very moving and important. I know Carl, myself, and the commissioner were all there, um, and it was important to see this topic elevated in that context. Um, I do want to point out for my uh, co-chair, uh, uh, Deborah Davis, she was not able to be here this morning. I think it's really important that we continue this conversation and that it be a conversation. Uh, I think it's incredibly important. And I mentioned this to you when we last spoke as a medical care provider myself, Kyle, a medical care provider, others, we want to emphatically state that we believe that proper medical care for victims of violence is of the utmost importance and that we want to continue this conversation. Let me just leave it there and we'll make sure that we have follow up. And again, feeding back to the commissioner and her team. And thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, as, as you highlighted, I mean, obviously, proper medical care and uh, care of these patients is, of course, of the utmost importance. It's, of course, disappointing to hear where there are gaps in care and trying to figure out how to improve that system, I think, is very important to do. And I think that's I think this is one of the great reasons to have this subcommittee. So um, just in terms of the CCMC update, Kelsey, I see that you have um, put your uh, comments in the uh, chat. Um, you know, I think uh, I want to give you a moment if you want to say anything uh, in particular to the group. Uh, no, not really. Just if anybody had, thank you to everybody that attended the showcase. Um, I think we had about 50 people in attendance at the beginning of January. Um, Looking forward to having more of those in the future. If anybody left that event with any lingering questions for any of the organizations, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat and I can get you connected to anyone individually. And thank you to Dr. Racian and the data and eval subcommittee for providing some evaluation support um, in the interim while we're waiting to get an official evaluator on the project. It's been really helpful. Great, thank you. Um, Janice, did you, uh, I, I want to wrap up with a few things, but go ahead if you want yes, to say something. I, I, I wanted to let Dr. James go first, so I lowered my hand, but after this conversation and hearing Jackie, I just had one question. I do know that I would love for a doctor to come to my home, but once that doctor leaves, who provides the care? Doctors don't, whether they're from asylum, whether they're from UConn, they're not there for the long term. Right. So when we say we have partners of doctors who come into the home, that's wonderful. 
right? That this doctor has taken time out to bring him and the medical students out into the community. We want more doctors doing that. But does that translate into receiving the long-term health care that doctors do not provide and certainly not in challenged communities? So I'll just leave it there. And thank you, James. I look forward to continuing the conversation with you and Dr. Anwar and the BPRC as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up with a few last comments. Uh, first is our uh, subcommittees should continue meeting on a monthly basis um, to be able to help advance uh, some of these topics. And as we heard here, for example, uh, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of fruit for conversation uh, for uh, Dr. Doddington and the group uh, working on that, but all of the groups should be working in that regard. Um, if you have specific topics for other presentations, uh, please uh, let our team know at DPH so that we can vet the presentations and topics and br make bring them you know to this group in a in a format that people can really help advance their ideas going forward. Um, and then our next uh, meeting is on April third. And with that, um, I would like just a motion to close the meeting. So moved. And second. if I have a second? Second. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that is the end of the meeting today and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>